Oh, for a few coconut shells, sighed Ernest. Oh, for half a dozen plates and as many silver spoons. Rejoin, rejoined, I smiled. Really, though, oyster shells would do? Said he, after a moment's thought. True, that is an idea worth having. Off with you, my boys. Get the oysters and clean out the sh a few shells. And none of you must complain because the spoons have no handles. And we grease our fingers a little in bawling the soup out. Jack was away and up to his knees in the water in the moment detaching the oysters. Ernest followed more leisurely and still unwilling to wet his feet. Stood by the margin of the pool and gathered his handkerchief, the oysters his brother threw him. As he, th as, as he thus stood, he picked up and pocketed a large mussel shell for his own use. As they returned with a good supply, we heard a shout from Fritz in the distance. We turned. We returned joyfully, and he presently appeared before us, his hands behind his back, and look of disappointment upon his countenance. Unsuccessful, he said. Really? I replied. Never mind, my boy. Better luck next time. Oh, Fritz, exclaimed his brother, who had looked behind him. A sucking pig, a little sucking pig. Where did you get it? How did you shoot it? Do let's see it, Fritz. Then the sparkling eyes exhibited his prize. I am glad to see the result of your prowess, my boy, said I, but I cannot approve of deceit even as a joke. Stick to the truth in jest and earnest. Wait a minute. Even if it's a joke, stick to the truth in jest and earnest. Fritz then told us how he had been to the other side of the stream. So different from this, he said. It is really a beautiful country, and the shore which runs down to the sea in a gentle slope is covered with all sorts of useful things from the wreck. Do let us, do let us go and collect them. And father, why should we not return to the wreck and bring home some of the animals? Just think of what value the cow would be to us. And what a pity it would be to lose her. Let us get her on shore, and we will moor over the stream, where she will have a good pasture, and we shall be in the shade instead of on this desert. And father, I do wish. Stop, stop, my boy, cried I. All will be done in good time. Tomorrow, the day after, will bring work of their own. And tell me. Did you see no traces of our shipmates? Not a sign of them, either on land or sea, living or dead, he replied. But the sucking pig, said Jack, where did you get it? It was one of several, said Fritz, which I found on the shore, along with some very curious little animals that hopped rather than walked, and every now and then would squat on their hind legs and rub their snouts with their forepaws. Had not I been afraid of losing all, I would have tried to catch one alive. They seemed so tame, but this was more easily taken. Meanwhile, Ernest had been carefully examining the animal in question. This is no pig, he said, and except for its briskly skin, does not look like one. See, its teeth are not like those of a pig, but rather of those of a squirrel. In fact, he continued looking at Fritz, your sucking pig is an agouti. Dear me, said Fritz. Listen to the great professor lecturing. He is going to prove that a pig is not a pig. You need not be so quick to laugh at your brother, I said, said I. In my turn, he is quite right. I too know the agouti by description and pictures, and there is little doubt that this is a specimen. The little animal makes its nest under the roots of trees and lives upon fruit. Its meat is white but dry, having no fat and never entirely loses a certain wild flavor, which is disagreeable to Europeans. It is held in great esteem by the natives where it lives, especially when the animal has been feeding near the sea on plants, impregnated with salt. But, Ernest, the agouti not only looks something like a pig, but most decidedly grunts like a porker. While we were thus talking, Jack had been vainly endeavoring to open an oyster with his large knife. Here is a simpler way, said I. Place an oyster on the fire. It immediately opened. Now, I continued, who will try this delicacy? 
all at first hesitated to partake of them, so unattractive did they appear. Jack, however, tightly closed his eyes and, making a face as though he was about to take medicine, gulped one down. We followed his example, one after the other, each doing so rather to provide himself with a spoon rather than with any hope of cultivating a taste for oysters. Our spoons are ready now, and gathering around the pot, we dip them in, not, however, without sundry scald fingers. Ernest then drew from his pocket the large shell he had procured for his own use, and scooping up a good quantity of soup, he put it down, th he put it down to cool, smiling at his own foresight. Prudence should be ex exercised for Prudence should be exercised for others, not just for oneself, I remarked. Are you so much better than your brothers? Your cool soup will do capitally for the dogs, my boy. Take it to them, and then come and eat like the rest of us. Ernest winced at this, but silently taking up his shell, he placed it on the ground before the hungry dogs, who lapped, it up, who lapped up its contents in a moment. He then returned, and after waiting for the soup to cool some more, we went merrily on our with our own dinner. While we were thus busily employed, we suddenly discovered that our dogs, not satisfied with their mouthful of soup, had a speed spied the agouti and were rapidly devouring it. The boys all began to yell, and Fritz first threw a stone at the dogs and then seizing his gun, flew to the rescue. It was their hungry jaws flew to the rescue it from their hungry jaws. Before I could prevent him, he, he struck one of them with such force that the gun was bent. The poor beast ran off howling, followed by a shower of stones from Fritz, who shouted and yelled at them so fiercely that if I had not interfered, it probably he would have killed them. I followed him, and as soon as he would listen to me, represented to him how despicable as well as wicked as much as such an outbreak of temper. For, I said, for, said I, you have hurt, if not actually wounded the dogs. You have distressed and frightened your mother, and you have spoiled your gun, which would have been so useful. Though Fritz's passion was easily aroused, it never lasted long, and speedily, speedily recovering himself, immediately he entreated, entreated his mother's pardon, and expressed his sorrow for, for his fault. By this time, the sun was sinking beneath the horizon, and the poultry, which had been straying to some little distance, gathered. Gathered round us. He began to pick up the crumb of biscuit which had fallen during the repast. My wife here, hereupon drew from her mysterious bag some handfuls of oats, peas, and other grains, and with them began to feed the poultry. She at the time showed me several other seeds of, of various vegetables. That was indeed thoughtful, said I, but pray be careful of what will be such value to us. We will bring plenty of damaged biscuits from the wreck, which though of no use as food for us, will suit the fowls very well indeed. The pigeons now flew up to crevices in the rocks and the fowls perched themselves on our tent pole. The ducks and geese waddled off, cackling and quacking, to the marshy margin of the river. We too were ready for repose, and having loaded our guns and offered up our prayers to God, thanking him for his many mercies to us, we commended ourselves to his protective care, and as the last ray of light departed, closed our tent and lay down to rest. The children remarked the suddenness, the suddenness of the nightfall, for indeed there had been little to new twilight. This convinced me that we must we must be not far from their equator, for twilight results from the refraction of the sun's rays. The more oblique these rays fall, the further does the partial light extend, while the more perpendicular they strike the earth, the longer, they, the longer do they continue their undiminished force, until when the sun sinks, they totally disappear, thus producing sudden darkness. We should... Chapter 2. We should have been badly off without the shelter of our tent, for the, for the night proved as cold as the day had been hot. 
but we managed to sleep comfortably, everyone being thoroughly fatigued by our labors of the day. The voice of our vigilant cook, which, as he loudly saluted the rising moon, was the last sound I heard of the night, roused me at daybreak, and I then, and I then awoke my wife. That is the strict interval while yet our children slept. We might take counsel together in our situation and prospects. It was plain to both of us that in the first place, sh we should ascertain, if possible, the fate of our late companions, and then examine into the resolution that as soon as, as he had breakfast, Fritz and I should start on an expedition with those objects in view. While my, while, uh, while my wife remained near our landing, place with the three younger boys, Rouse up, rouse up, my boys, cried I, awakening the children cheerfully. Come and help your mother to get breakfast ready. As to what? She said, smiling. We can but set on a pot and boil some more soup. Why, you forgot Jack's fine lobster, replied I. What has become of it, Jack? It has been safe in the hole in the rock all night, father, you see. I thought, as the dogs seemed to like good things, they might take a fancy to that as well as to the agati. A very sensible precaution, remarked I. I believe even my headless jack will learn wisdom in time. It is, it is well the lobster is so large, for we shall want to take part with us on our excursion today. As at the mention of the excursion, the four children were wild with delight and campering around me, clapping their hands for joy. Steady there, steady there, said I. You cannot expect all to go. Such an expedition as, as this would be too dangerous and fatiguing for you, younger ones, and this place seems perfectly safe. Fritz and I will go alone this time with one of the dogs, leaving the other to defend you. Fritz prepared the guns and tie up F F Flora so that she will not follow us. At the, at the word guns, the poor boy blushed shamefully. He tried in vain to straighten his weapon. I left him alone for a short time. But at length I gave, him, I gave him leave to take another, perceiving with pleasure that the vexation had produced a proper feeling in his mind. A moment later he tried to lay hold of Flora to tie her up, but the doll, re recollecting the blows she had so lately received, began to snarl and would not go near him. Turk behaved the same, and I found it necessary to call him with my own voice to induce them to, to, induce them to approach us. Fritz then, in tears, entreated some biscuits of his mother, declaring that he would rather go without the rest of his biscuits to make his peace with the dogs. He accordingly carried them some biscuits, stroked and caressed them, and in every motion seemed to ask their pardon. As of all animals, without accepting man, the dog is least addicted to revenge, and at the same time it is the most sensible of kind usage. Flora instantly relented and began to lick the hands which fed her, but Turk, who was of more fierce and independent temper, still held off, and seemed to lack confidence in Fritz's advances. Give him a claw of lobster, cried Jack, for I meant to give it to you anyway, for your journey. With that treat, Turk seemed ready to forgive Fritz. We were armed, we then had armed ourselves, each taking a gun and a, and a game bag. Fritz, in addition, sticking a pair of pistols in his belt, and I a small hatchet in mine. Breakfast being over, we stowed away the remainder of our lobster and biscuits, with a flask of water, and were ready for a start. Stop, I claimed. We still have yet something very important undone. Surely not, said Fritz. Yes, said I. We have not yet joined in morning prayer. We are only too, we are only too ready, amid the cares and pleasures of this life, to forget the God to whom we owe all things. Then having commended ourselves to his protective care, I took leave of my wife and children and bidding them not to wander far from the boat and tent. We parted not without some anxiety on, e on either side, for we knew not what might assail us in this unknown region. We now found that the banks of the stream were on both sides so rocky and we could get down to the water by only one narrow passage, and there was no corresponding path on the other side. I was glad to see this, however, for I now know that my wife and children were on comparative, 
comparatively incessant spot. The other side of the tent being protected by steep and precipitous cliffs, Fritz and I pursued our way up the stream until we reached a point where the waters fell from a considerable height in a cascade and where several large rocks lay half covered by the water. By means of these, we succeeded in crossing the stream in safety. We thus had the sea on our left and a long line of rocky heights, here and there adorned with clumps of trees, stretching away inland to the right. We had forced our way scarcely fifty yards through the long rank grass, which was here partly withered by the sun and much tangled. When we were much when we were much alarmed on hearing behind us a rustling and on looking around we saw the grass waving to and fro and as if some animal were passing through it fritz instantly turned and brought his gun to his shoulder ready to fire the moment the beast should appear I was much pleased with my son's coolness and presence of mind, for it showed me that I might thoroughly rely upon him and on any future occasion when real danger might occur. This time, however, no savage beast, no savage beast rushed out, but our trusty dog Turk, whom in our anxiety at parting we had forgotten and who had been sent after us doubtless, doubtless by my thoughtful wife. I did not fail to commend both the bravery and the discretion of my son in not yielding to even a rational alarm and for waiting until he was sure the object before he was resolved to fire. From this little incident, however, we saw how dangerous was our position and how difficult escape would be should any fierce beast steal upon us unawares. We therefore hastened to make our way to the open seashore. Here the scene which presented itself was indeed delightful, a, bra a background of hills, the green wavy grass and the pleasant group of trees stretching here and there to the very water's edge. Formed a lovely prospect on the smooth sand we searched carefully for any trace of our hapless companions, but not the mark of a footstep could we find. Shall I fire a shot or two, said Fritz, that would bring our companions if they are within hearing, it would indeed, I replied, or any savage that may be here. No, no, let us search diligently, but as quietly as possible. But why, father, should we trouble ourselves about them at all? They left us to shift for ourselves, and I, for one, don't care to set eyes upon them again. You are wrong, my boy, said I. In the first place, we should not return evil for evil. Then again, they might be of great assistance to us in building a house of some sort. And lastly, you must remember that they, that they took nothing with them from their vessel and may be perishing of hunger. But Father, while we are wandering here and losing our time, almost without a hope of benefit to them, why should we not instead return to our vessel and save the animals on board? When a variety of duties present themselves for our choice, we should always give the preference to that which can confer the most solid advantage, I replied. The savage of the life of a man is more exalted, more exalted, act, what? The, the saving of a life of a man is a more exalted action than contributing to the comfort of a few quadrupeds whom we have already supplied with food for a few days. Also, the sea is so calm at present that we may need not fear that the ships will sink or break entirely before we can return. Thus talking, we pushed on until we came to a pleasant grove, which stretched down to the water's edge. Here we halted to rest, seating ourselves under a large tree. By a rivet which murmured and splashed along its pebbly bed into the great ocean before us, a thousand gaily plumaged birds flew twittering above us, and Fritz and I gazed up at them. My son suddenly started up. A monkey, he exclaimed. I am nearly sure I saw a monkey. 
As he spoke, he sprang around to the other side of the tree, and in doing so, stumbled over a small round object which he handed to me, remarking as he did so that it was a round, a, a round bird's nest, of which he had often heard. You may have done so, said I, laughing, but you need not necessarily conclude that every round hairy thing is a bird's nest. This, for instance, is not one, but a coconut. Do you not remember reading that a coconut is enclosed within a round fibrous covering over a hard shell, which again is surrounded by a bulky green hull? In this one, you hold in your hand and the outer hull has been destroyed by time, which is the reason why the twisted fiber of the inner covering are so apparent. Let us now break the shell and you will see the nut inside. Not without difficulty, we split open the nut, but to our disgust found the kernel dry and uneatable. Oh, hello, cried Fritz. I always thought a coconut was full of delicious sweet liquid like almond milk. So it is, I replied. When young and fresh, but as it ripes, the milk becomes congealed and in course of time it solidifies into a kernel. This kernel then dries, as you can see, but then the nut falls on favorite soil. The germ within the kernel swells until it bursts through the shell, and taking root springs up a new tree. I do not understand, said Fritz, how the little green germ manages to get through this great thick shell, which is not like an almond or a hazelnut shell. That is divided down the middle already. Nature provides all things, I answered, taking up the pieces. Look here, do you see these three holes near the stalk? It is through them that the germ obtains egress. Now, let us find a good nut, if we can, as coconuts must be overripe before they fall naturally from the tree. It was not without difficulty that we obtained one in which the kernel was not dried up. It was a little oily and rancid, but this was not the time to be particular. We were so refreshed by the fruit that we could deter and repast our own dinner until later in the day, and so spare our own stock of provisions. Dinner refers continuing our way through the ticket, which was so densely overgrown with lianas that we had to clear a passage with our hatchets. We again emerged on the seashore beyond and found an open view, the forest sweeping inland, while on the space before us stood at intervals single trees of remarkable appearance. There at once attract these at once attracted Fritz's observant eye, and he poised to them, exclaiming, Oh, what absurd looking trees, father! See what strange bumps there are on the trunks? We approached to examine them, and I recognized them as calabash, calabash trees, the fruit of which grows in this curious way on the stems, and it is a species of gourd, from the hard rind of which bowls, spoons, and bottles can be made. The savages, I remarked, are said to form these things most ingenu ingeniously, using them to contain liquids. Indeed, they actually cook food in them. Oh! But that is impossible, returned Fritz. I am quite sure this rind would be burnt through directly if it is set on fire. I did not say it was set on fire at all. When the gourd has been divided in two and the shell or rind emptied of its contents, it is filled with water, into which the fish or whatever it is to be cooked is put in. Red hot stones are added until the water boils. The food becomes fit to eat and the gourd rind remains uninjured. That is very clever plan. Very simple, too. I dare say I should have hit on it if I had tried, said Fritz. The friends of Columbus thought it was very easy to make an egg stand upon its end when he had shown them how to do it. But now suppose we prepare some of these calabashes that they may be ready for use when we take them home. Fritz instantly took up one of the gourds and tried to split it equally with his knife, but in vain. The blade slipped and the, ca and the calabash was cut jaggedly. What a nuisance, said Fritz, flinging it down. The thing is spoiled, and yet it seems so simple to fight it properly. Stay, said I. You are too impatient. Those pieces are not useless. Do you try to fashion them from a spoon or two while I provide a dish? I then took from my pocket a piece of string, which I tied tightly around the gourd, as near one end of it as I could, then tapping, 
the string with the back of my knife. It penetrated the outer shell. When this was accomplished, I tied the string yet tighter and drawing the ends with all my might. The gourd fell, divided exactly as I had wished. This is clever, cried Fritz. What in the world put that plan in your head? It is a plan, I replied. This which savages adopt, as I have learned from books about travel. Well, it certainly makes a capital soup churin and a soup plate too, said Fritz, exa examining the gourd. But supposing you wanted to make a bottle, how would, you, how, would, how would you have set to work? It would be easier operation than this, if possible. All that is necessary is to cut a round hole at one end than to, scape, to scoop out the interior and to drop in several shot or stones. When these are shaken, any remaining portions of the fruit are detached and the gourd is thoroughly cleaned and the bottle completed. That would not make a very convenient bottle though, father. It would be more like a barrel. True, my boy. If you want a more shapely vessel, you must take it in hand when it is younger. To give it a neck, for instance, you must tie a band-aid around the young gourd while it is still in the tree, and then all will swell but the part from which it is checked. As I spoke, I filled the gourd with sand and let them to dry, making the spot as we might return for them on our way back. Are the bottle-shaped gourds I have seen in Europe trained similarly? No, they are from another species, and what you have seen is their natural shape. For three hours or more, we pushed forward, keeping a sharp lookout on either side for any trace of our companions, till we reach a bold promontory. Stretching some of the way into the sea from, the, from whose rocky summit, I knew that we should obtain a good and comprehensive view of the surrounding country. With little difficulty, we reached the top, but the most carefully survey of the beautiful landscape failed to show us the slightest sign or trace of human beings. Before us stretched a wide and lovely bay, fringed with yellow sands, either side extending into the distance and almost lost to view in two shadowy promontories. Enclosed by these two arms lay a sheet of rippling water, which reflected in its depth the glorious sun above. The scene inland was no less beautiful, and yet Fritz and I both felt a shade of loneliness stealing over us as we gazed on its other solitude. Cheer up, Fritz, my boy, said I. Presently remember that we chose a settler's life long ago, before we left our own dear country. We certainly did not expect to be so utterly alone, but what matters a, what matters a few people, more or less? With God's help, let us endeavor to live here contently, thankfully that we were not cast upon some barren and inhospitable island. But come, the heat here is getting unbearable. Let us find some shade place before we are completely broiled away. We descended the hill and made for a clump of palm trees, which we sat at a little distance. To reach this, we had to pass through a dense thicket of reeds. No pleasant or easy task for, besides the difficulty of forcing our way through, I feared at, each, at every step that we might tread on some venomous snake, sending Turk into an Sending Turk in advance, I cut one of the reeds, thinking it would be more useful weapon against a reptile than my gun. I had carried it but a, a little way when I noticed a thick juice excuting, ex excuting from one end. I tasted it, and to my delight, I found it sweet and pleasant. I at once knew that I was standing amongst sugar cane. Wishing Fritsch to make the same discovery, I advised him to cut a cane for his defense. He did so, and as he beat the ground before him, the, the reed split and his hand was covered with the juice. He carefully touched the cane with the tip of his tongue, then finding the sweet juice, he did so again with less hesitation, and a moment afterwards sprang back to me, exclaiming, Oh, father, sugar cane, sugar cane, taste it. Oh, how delicious, how delightful. Do let us take a lot home to mother. He continued sucking eagerly on the cane. Gently there, said I, take breath a moment. Moderation in all things, remember? Cut some, cut some to take home if you like. 
only don't take more than you can conveniently carry. In spite of my warning, my son cut a dozen or more of the largest canes and stripping them of their leaves, carrying them under his arm. We pushed through the cane break and reached the clump of palms for which we had been making. As we entered it, a troop of monkeys who had been dis disporting themselves on the ground sprang up, chattering and grimacing, and before we were clearly distinguished them, they were on the very top of the trees. Fritz was so provoked by their impertinent gestures that he raised his gun and would have shot one of the poor beasts. Stay, cried I. Never take the life of any animal needlessly. A live monkey up in the tree is of more use to us than a dozen dead ones at our feet. And I will show you. Saying this, I gather a handful of small stones and threw them up towards the apes, and the stones did not go near them. But influenced by their instinctive mania for intimidation, they, instinct they instantly seized all the coconuts within their reach and sent a perfect tail of them down upon us. Fritz was delighted with what stratagem and rushing forward picked up some of the finest of the nuts. We drank the milk that they contained, drawing it through the holes which I pierced. The milk of the coconut was not a pleasant flavor, but it is excellent for quenching thirst. What we liked best was the kind of solid cream which adheres to the shells, of which we scraped off with our spoons. After this delicious meal, we thoroughly despised the lobster. We had been carrying and threw it to Turk, who ate it gratefully. But far from being satisfied, the poor beast began to gnaw the ends of the sugar cane and beg for a coconut. I slung a couple of nuts over my shoulder, fastened them together by their stalks, and Fritz, having resumed his burden, we began our homeward march.